Thank you very much for coming along to the Intensive Care Society's uh, session, which, uh, we, which I'm really looking forward to. It's going to be a, a discussion by Juliet Davenport, Paul Eakins, and Teresa Dominich, uh, who will talk about um, all sorts of things related to individuals in every area of our lives to reduce our impact we have on the planet and limit our contribution to climate change. Uh, so we're going to talk about energy, transport, and why a circular economy could help us to reach net zero. Uh, just for some housekeeping, at the bottom of the uh, screen, you'll notice a Q&A box. Uh, you can certainly answer, you can ask questions there, and we can try and answer those as we go along. Uh, that would be very uh, useful for, for all of us. So uh, our first speaker today, or this evening, uh, in my case, is Juliet Davenport, founder and uh, director of Good Energy, a 100% renewable energy company with a mission to power a greener, cleaner future together, which is uh, entirely relevant, I'm led to believe, because I read the paper, and I realise that there's some energy issues going on, both from a liquid and also an electric point of view and gas point of view there right now in the UK. So, um, uh, Juliet is a, a board member of the Crown Estate, a council member of Innovate UK, chair of ZapMap, and joining us while she charges her electric vehicle. Uh, Juliet, uh, please commence. Forbes, thank you. And apologies if you can hear the rain because um, it's also raining while I'm charging my electric vehicle. So that's the patter is the rain on the windscreen. Um, so thank you so much for that introduction, Forbes. I mean, um, what I'm going to do today is sort of take you through a set of slides that was a piece of work that we did looking at a future for the UK with a customer centric approach. So really looking about what households, what businesses could do in delivering net zero, be part of delivering net zero. And the reason we did that is because I think it's recognized that a lot of the work to date that's gone on in developing new renewables here, but also um, in, in other, across the world has been the easy part. So we've done a lot of the kind of early sector sec stage technologies versus sort of the ones that you can just deploy out there. The next piece is going to need nearly 60% of the next set of um, work that we need to do is going to include consumer behavior. And that is going to be an incredibly important part alongside technology, but consumer behavior is going to be an incredibly good, important part of delivering net zero. Um, so I'm going to ask this, yes, brilliant. Thank you to share the slides. Thank you so much. So, so we created a piece of work with something called the Energy Systems Catapult, which is an organization um, that actually works for Climate Change Committee and other government bodies. And we basically went to challenge them and say, we want to put in a scenario that is customer centric and we want to see a future that is as close to 100% renewable as possible. And that was the basis of this piece of work. Can you go to the next slide, please? And um, sort of when we look at the urgency in net around net zero, um, I, I actually look at it in terms of five pillars. And, and what you find in energy policy or regulation discussions or industry discussions, people tend to focus on infrastructure and regulation. Those are the areas we want this policy from government or we need this financial support, or we need this. I actually think it's much broader than that. So first of all, research and innovation has been something very forgotten in the energy sector. If you look at the research um, over the last 10 years in the UK, uh, we spent, um, I think it's about 4.3 billion on me uh, medical research, about 3.4 on aerospace um, and aeronautical research, um, about three, just under three on automotive and 0.2 on energy. So my view is that we need to redress that balance definitely in terms of the future for energy. But you can see that the consumer is quite often forgotten in this conversation. So consumer and the skills capability in this marketplace is really not a part of what most policymakers think of when they start to think of this net zero approach. And part of the reason for this doing this work was to really highlight where is the involvement of the consumer going to be in there. Can you take me to the next slide, please? So the key findings of the piece of work show that if we want to get to net zero, electrification of everything is pretty key. Um, and this is not, there, there are various different discussions about how much can you do with hydrogen and how much, but this scenario really says, if you want to fully decarbonize, you decarbonize predominantly with electricity across both heat and transport. Um, 
people power is really important. So uh, you may take a view that it's relatively dangerous to glue yourself to the M25. Um, Forbes, that's a reference to the most recent um, demonstrations around the M25 on energy efficiency, which to be honest, is the first time I've seen a demonstration on energy efficiency. It's something that's normally forgotten and rather dull, um, but insulating our homes is incredibly important. And I think that's both from a health point of view, but from an energy point of view, just basically heating our homes so we just let it out the windows and roofs is incredibly wasteful and really doesn't help us with net zero. So energy efficiency is absolutely key for the UK. Um, and then looking at what are the other things that you can do in your home? So home storage, that's going to be a new thing, whether you use the batteries in your existing car, in, a, in an electric car to store in your home, or whether you install a, a separate home storage generation. I think we're going to see, as the prices of solar panels come down, we're going to see more and more people actually install their own solar panels because it can insulate you not only against climate change, but also against future energy bills. Um, and, and actually, we, what we call demand side response, which is where you actually get interaction between people and the energy market and people switch on and switch off powers at different points. And to deliver all this, we have worked out that you can deliver this 98% of this meeting with renewable technologies. Now, most people wouldn't consider that, but that is, that's basically pushing it to its edge. The key to that is storage and flexibility. We're gonna need to make sure we install significant storage um, and uh, the ability to flex people's demand and supply. And finally, this is a similar cost to the existing BAU, business as usual an analysis of, of what climate change is gonna cost. So actually going 100% renewable can really put people at the heart of this conversation um, and using electricity as your key decarbonization. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, and, and how do we do this? So for the UK, this looks like offshore wind is predominantly the technology, but actually we see improvements and increase in large scale solar, some onshore wind, domestic solar, so that's people putting solar on the roofs. And we have significant tidal and geothermal resources that are completely underutilized in this country. And those need to play a role if we want to get to a renewable mix like this for 2050. Next slide. And people always worry. So we've just had an energy, we've got an energy crisis ongoing in the UK because gas prices are so high. And this was put under particular pressure because we had a period of low wind caused by a hurricane down in the, um, down in the Caribbean. Um, and, but actually a lot of this modeling is always done that how do you actually manage that through? And that is why technologies like geothermal, wave, um, tidal, and the storage and flexibility is going to be incredibly important to be able to deal with this stress test in the system. Next slide, please. Um, and I think I've just I touched on already, UK housing stock is the oldest in Europe. It's really inefficient. And this just compares it to other European countries. So you look at Belgium and the UK have got pretty similar housing stock, but most uh, particularly the further north you go, housing stock is looking pretty good. And for me, the housing stock is as big a part about net zero as our energy system itself. Um, and actually what this does is if you can reduce the total amount of energy, you reduce the peak demand and you reduce the demand for flexibility at these really difficult periods that we're experiencing right now in the UK. Next slide, please. And uh, this, this then talks about where, where actually do we see the, the heat coming from? And you can see there is a role for technologies like hydrogen, um, uh, but the majority of it comes from electricity, district heating, and electricity really through heat pumps um, and larger district heating networks. Can we go to the next slide, please? And electric vehicles. Well, I mean, Paul just mentioned, and he's going to, I'll leave this one to Paul, but the likelihood is the UK is not only experiencing an energy crisis, we're also experiencing a road haulier crisis, really, a petrol crisis, because there's not enough petrol at the pumps. Um, people are now looking at electric vehicles. I'm currently sitting in one charging as we speak. Um, and the, the, the likelihood is the electric vehicle is the one that is easy to deal with, it's easy to drive. And I think it, it is so far, at least the transport for the future. But that needs to be looked at in addition to public transport, 
and encouraging people to walk and cycle more often. But one of the key things is we can't all plug in our electric vehicles at the same time. So smart charging is going to absolutely have to be part of this. Um, so you can't just come in home from work and plug in your vehicle. It will have to have a delay mechanism on it and be able to smart charge during the night. Thank you, next one. And this just gives you an indication of what the costs look like. And in fact, what we see is actually electricity generation costs and storage costs and backup costs go down because we've invested in two things. We've invested in more networks and we've invested in our housing stock and our, our energy efficiency costs. And then everything else remains similar to the baseline. The next slide, please. So finally, so sort of what, what, do, what does this mean? So do the known now. So there are a bunch of technologies that are already delivering zero carbon at a low cost, and that is mainly wind and solar. Unleash people power. So people are going to be a key part of this. Our homes are essentially going to be part of an energy system. And whether that's your smart fridge connecting up, your smart freezer, um, your electric vehicle, your solar panel, whatever it is in your home, the homes are going to become smarter and we're going to be able to use them much more efficiently so we don't have to waste power delivering power to people's homes when they don't need it. Embrace diversity. So making sure that we're using a range of technologies is going to be really important because just trying to fix it all with a, a sort of the, the silver bullet approach to technology doesn't work and won't work. And what we need is a whole range of things that will interact with each other. Um, the UK has some great, great resources. Uh, we don't use them to the maximum. I'm sure that's the same Forbes in Australia. You've got, it's pretty windy in parts of Australia. It's pretty sunny in other parts. Um, there are, we have natural resources in all of these countries that we could use to much better um, efficiency. And also for, for, for me, this scenario that includes significant energy efficiency and renewables is, is um, goes beyond 2050. It doesn't just get to a point in time and then stop you can carry on. It, it takes you way beyond 2050 for the next set of generations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Juliet. Great uh, talk. I'm just gonna ask maybe one question. Um, yeah. Just thinking about the, the whole equity issue as well with um, tenants and people who don't own houses, et cetera. Yeah. I presume you've given that quite a bit of thought or? Well, I mean, I think those those are the pieces that you now need to get into. What we've done is this high level piece is what is possible. And now what you need to do is to understand is, is getting into the detail. And one of the reasons I set up a business in the first place is when you set up a business, you actually have to fix things. Because if you want to deliver something, you then have to go and find out what are all the policy things in the way? What are the, all the human behavior systems that are in the way? And what are the other things that get in the way? And something like tenanted homes, I mean, one of the things uh, I, I did a recent launch with an org, um, uh, 30 social housing organizations who are just beginning to invest in new housing in the UK. And one of the things they're looking at is prefab buildings so that they can build in the energy efficiency right up front. And so, first of all, what we need to make sure is that sort of anything new should be built with really high levels of energy efficiency. And that is a policy piece. And that is also making sure that the manufacture process can embed it. So, that's also an R&D piece. So you need to bring those two pieces together. But as I said at the beginning, there's not one single policy that fixes this. You need the skills, you need the R&D, and you need the infrastructure and the policy makers. And that, you, you bring all of those pieces together to make sure this is what works. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I think we're gonna move on. I, I'm finding it a bit tricky. I'm not sure if others can see the actual questions there, my view of the screen has um, got that, but we might be able to just come back to those as we go along, unless there's something you can see there. Cass Grimes is doing a wonderful job in the background organizing this evening's show. Um, Cass, we might have one, a moment of time for one or two other questions, if you can find them, if, if any have come through. If not, we'll move on. Okay, so um, thank you once again, Juliet. Um, we'll introduce now Professor Paul Eakins, uh, Professor of Resources and Environmental Policy at the University College London, Institute for Sustainable Resources, uh, working on uh, conditions and policies for achieving environmentally sustainable economy. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to all sorts of stories about uh, 
low carbon futures, uh, fossil fuels and hydrogen. And we're going to talk about transport today. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, you want to share your screen, yes, I think. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Forbes. I will indeed share my screen and um, we'll take it from there. So there we go. And um, let's move on. So I, I'd like always to start with a kind of global view of things, because uh, otherwise we get caught up in little UK um, bubbles. And a good place to start is the Global Goals for Sustainable Development, sometimes called the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Um, these were agreed by governments in 2015, and there are 17 of them, as you can see, and they are an extraordinary aspiration, the most ambitious uh, future it's possible uh, to imagine, I think, for humanity as a whole. Um, they come after the Millennium Development Goals, which uh, ran from 2000 to 2015. And the difference between these goals and the Millennium Development Goals is that there are now some goals exclusively devoted to environment. So you can look down at 13, 14, 15. But actually, the environment runs through these goals in a way that was not at all the case earlier. So environment has kind of arrived. And obviously, 13 climate action is very much the one that we're talking about now. So the current trends in transport are at odds with at least three, five, six of these SDGs. Um, good health and well-being, uh, air pollution, to which transport, current transport makes a huge contribution, uh, is the major source uh, of um, premature death. Um, uh, in as far as environmental issues are concerned. So that's something like five to seven million people a year. Um, they exacerbate uh, inequalities in the sense that transport becomes a huge distinguisher. I was fascinated with um, Bill Gates writing a book on uh, climate change um, earlier this year or, or late last year and yet saying that he was gonna to continue to use his private plane, which is 20 times more carbon intensive than flying business class, um, because that's kind of what a man like he does. Um, well, um, sustainable cities and communities uh, are, are built around the car very largely, certainly in many developed countries and many developing countries are going the same way. Sustainable production and consumption, the transport system is an enormous cause of unsustainability. Um, climate change, a huge contributor to climate change. Uh, and um, because of the quantity of land that road infrastructure takes, um, a, a major influence on that. So the current transport system is about as incompatible with the sustainable development goals as it's possible to be. Because cars are getting bigger, there are more and more of them, and they're being driven further. Uh, that's a global trend, uh, but it applies uh, to pretty well all countries. More roads are being built. The UK currently has a 27 billion road building program uh, on top of the roads that we've got all met already. People are flying more and more often. Obviously, COVID did a big dent in that. I'm going to have a look at the data in a minute. And current airports are being expanded. So um, we're, we're well set on this currently unsustainable transport trend. And I'm going to talk a bit about now what we might do about that. The UK uh, has not been unsuccessful in curbing its energy use and therefore reducing its emissions from energy use. And you can say that, see there the four major, major sectors that are often talked about here. So electricity will have been allocated to the, these different sectors as well. And you can see that transport is now the highest energy using sector in the UK. It grew pretty constantly from 1970 to 2008. Then we had the financial crash. It dropped and it's been growing a bit since then, um, uh, less fast. So here's motor vehicle traffic. Um, and this is uh, government transport statistics. And you can see that that since 1990 has grown predominantly. It shows the overwhelming dominance of cars and taxis. 
um, uh, and everything else pales into insignificance uh, among, uh, uh, apart from that. And there we've got um, trends in transport consumption. And again, there you've got the overwhelming dominance of road transport. The units in those last two diagrams are this MTOE, million tons of oil equivalent up the left, uh, and then dates uh, along, the, uh, uh, along the horizontal axis. The other trend there to notice, obviously, is the growth in air traffic. So if we look back in 1970, it's really quite a small little blue, um, uh, blue band, and it's grown very substantially through to the uh, end of um, through this decade. Uh, and along with the energy use, as you would expect, we've had greenhouse gas emissions because transport is overwhelmingly powered by fossil fuels um, globally and in the UK. So carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas. There's a bit of methane and a bit of nitrous oxide as well. Again, the effect here of the um, financial crash uh, and uh, the slight growth in greenhouse gas emissions since then. If we look at this on an index basis, you can see that the little green line here matches almost entirely the, the total transport, which is the dotted line, because of the dominance of road transport. But what this diagram does show is the huge uh, proportional growth of aviation uh, over this 40-year uh, period. Um, uh, although there's been a certain uh, increase in rail use, uh, you can see that uh, the energy consumption of that has, has gone down and it's been the increase in real use has been nothing like as great. And if we allocate the uh, transport energy consumption to industry, households and services, again, we're talking about the great bulk of that being household energy use. So this is you and me, uh, not to put too fine a point on it. Uh, and of course, that million tons of oil equivalent is all fossil fuels and it's all carbon dioxide comes out of the back when that's used. There's been a switch from petrol to diesel. Um, that was largely driven by public policy towards the end of the 1980s um, because diesel was perceived to be more energy efficient, which of course it is. Um, and so we got some carbon dioxide benefits from that because you you drive further per liter of fuel, but unfortunately it's far more polluting at a local level. So all the particulates and the nitrous oxide that comes out um, from motor cars is much more pronounced from diesel than from petrol. So this is if we're experiencing bad air quality uh, in a country like the UK, in our cities, this is one of the major reasons that the quantity of the proportion of diesel has grown dramatically uh, over the last 30 years. Then we come to what's got to happen if we're going to get anywhere near net zero, which is what Juliet was talking about. And this comes from the uh, Climate Change Committee's sixth carbon budget report. Here we are, million tons of CO2e. So that's about 120 um, million where, where we are in 2020. Um, and net zero means zero, effectively. So here's the line that goes down to net zero. If we don't do anything about this, we can expect the top line to be um, uh, the, the one that uh, is where we end up. So we'll probably end up at something like 140 million tons. Uh, but of course, there are policies in place already uh, to ensure that doesn't happen. Um, they're probably not strong enough. And if we look at the scenario that the Climate Change Committee did, well, the purple thing is emission reduction. So us using uh, is demand reduction rather, is uh, us using uh, less uh, private transport. We got a little bit of increases in conventional vehicle efficiency, but that, peters, that peters out after about 2035 because there aren't so many conventional vehicles coming on and therefore manufacturers won't be improving their efficiency. We've got some other zero emission vehicles, probably hydrogen, as you saw from that, um, that diagram that uh, Juliet showed. Uh, we've got uh, heavy goods vehicles converting away from diesel. Uh, we've got vans, but the biggest change, as you would expect, given where we are on previous slides, 
is in the cars and the switch to zero emission vehicles. I was asked just to include a slide on life cycle assessment um, so that how do we know that um, electric vehicles are better for the environment than uh, conventional internal combustion engines. And this is quite a complicated slide. But uh, if you just focus on these columns to start with, we've basically got electricity uh, driven vehicles all down here, electricity, ve different vehicles of different kinds of electricity um, and different um, kinds of uh, di di different kinds of batteries, some of them fuel cells, etc. And then we've got the petrol, diesel and natural gas vehicles here. And the way life cycle assessment works is that you go, you work through all the various um, components of environmental impact from um, the road system or the different cars in this case, uh, and then see which is biggest. And so the black uh, bit is the allocation to road building. And you can see that's common, obviously, for all these different cars, which car you have doesn't change that. You've got the vehicle without the propulsion battery, so basically the car uh, without any consideration of the battery, and that's this gray block. You've got the battery itself, and down for these petrol, diesel, and natural gas vehicles, that's obviously a very small component. In fact, it's invisible here, but you start being able to see it once you get to the electric vehicle. You've got fuel cell systems for the fuel cell cars that uh, might be using hydrogen, uh, hydrogen made in this way. You've got uh, exhaust emissions. And of course, the exhaust emissions come from those. This is the red uh, diagram. This is the uh, emissions that come out the back of the car. And obviously, that only applies if you're using fossil fuels. You've got non-exhaust emissions, which are more or less invisible. And then you've got the emissions from the fuel. And the first thing to notice about that is that the emissions from the fuel are biggest for a compact car with fuel cell where the uh, hydrogen has been created by average electricity today. Um, because average electricity, of course, is not decarbonized. So RER here stands for average European electricity. And unless we decarbonize the electricity system, electric vehicles have no benefit over these conventional vehicles at all. But of course, once you've decarbonized the electricity system, so we come up here for a compact car with a, a, a zebra type battery with certified electricity, which is renewable electricity in this case, you can see that the um, global warming uh, emissions are much, much less than these three conventional vehicles. So Juliet's um, uh, First, number one, decarbonize electricity is indeed necessary for transport, just as it is for all sorts of other uses. Of course, things don't stay the same. And so this, uh, these are a, a different life cycle analysis that seeks to compare how these three technologies, internal combustion engines, plug-in hybrid vehicles, and battery electric vehicles might develop between 2010 and 2050. And you can see that um, by 2050, the battery electric vehicle is projected here to have practically no emissions from uh, the fuel source uh, at all. Um, so just these little 7% there, um, and all the rest is coming from making the motor car and the battery. At the other extreme, you've got only 9% of the emissions from the petrol car, and of course they're much, much more than they are um, per kilometer than the battery electric vehicle, and the rest all comes from the fuel. But even the internal combustion engine has become much more efficient over that period than, um, it, is in than it was in 2010. So that's kind of the baseline of where we are with the, these kind of transport issues. Turning to aviation, this was the, Climate Change Committee's projection for the aviation sector, you can see that, and this is just the UK, of course, and that even with lockdown, which we all experienced, those of us who were in the UK uh, in uh, 2020, uh, you can see that 
certainly aviation fell by about 50%, but there was still a lot of flying going on. And I was amazed by that because certainly people like me were not flying anywhere at all. We weren't leaving our homes uh, for a lot of that period. But nevertheless, there was still quite a, quite a bit of flying. And you can see how it's um, projected to bounce back and indeed is bouncing back even as we speak. And you see these long queues at, uh, at um, uh, airport terminals. And so how are we going to reduce aviation emissions? Well, you can see here that we're not getting down to zero by 2050 because it's really difficult. So these emissions will have to be offset in some way. And I've got a word or two to say about that in a minute, uh, these residual emissions in gray. But there's quite a significant projection in reduction in demand, which means us flying less. There's a certain bit here for sustainable aviation fuels mainly biofuels from bioenergy. And um, then there's a little bit from efficiency and hybrid, so having electric batteries and stuff in there to substitute a bit from the fossil fuels. And people are looking also at the possibilities of hydrogen. So what are the conclusions we can get from those sorts of data? Well, number one is that we can't do this ourselves as individuals entirely. So government has an absolutely critical role to play in providing the infrastructure and helping us to decarbonize our travel. That's not to say that individuals aren't important, and my next slide is about individuals, but I get very frustrated when people seem to imply that it's all an individual kind of job. Actually, it's a government job first, and individuals can't do much without government. So. Um, we've got to completely decarbonize electricity, greatly increase the quantity of renewable electricity. We can help with that, as you'll see in the next slide, but um, uh, we need incentives for that from the government, as, as we've seen with the huge increase in offshore wind um, uh, in this country. Uh, we've, we've got to subsidize uh, electric vehicles until they compete with internal combustion engines. At the moment, they're much more expensive. There are all sorts of... Uh, optimistic projections uh, for 2025 that suggest that by then uh, they won't be more expensive than internal combustion engines, but we'll have to wait and see about that. But we certainly can't wait until 2025. We will, um, so we need, we'll need some subsidies for that. Uh, we obviously need charging points. And a colleague of mine took his family on a trip around the UK in an electric vehicle, and he had enormous trouble charging it up on the way. A couple of small fractious kids in the back you know, uh, waiting for an hour and a half at uh, filling stations because either the charging uh, systems don't work or there are huge queues for them. Obviously, this is not happy. Um, <laughs> recently, we've seen the same kind of queues affecting um, uh, petrol and diesel charging filling stations, but there we go. We've got to stop building and expanding roads and, and airports. Um, uh, it, it was really quite interesting that when Boris Johnson produce his famous 10 point plan at the end of last year, he trumpeted that there was a great budget for the decarbonization of the whole UK economy of 12 billion. At the same time, we've got a roads budget over the same period of time of 27 billion. So um, you, you, you need to put these numbers in context to see just how seriously we're taking this decarbonization issue. We've got to greatly improve public transport, trains, buses, high speed rail, I'm terribly lucky. I live in London. I don't need a car in London. I haven't had a car in London since 1980. Lots of people do have cars in London, and I pity them because they're a huge nuisance um, uh, in my experience. But nevertheless, they do have them, and they're very big vehicles, and they block the whole system up. But there are lots of people living in the UK in more rural areas where really public transport is so appalling that if you were to remove cars, um, they'd be completely depopulated because no one could afford to live there at all because they couldn't get about. So public transport's really important. Then you've got to constrain car use in urban areas in favor of walking and cycling. That's where most of this reduction in demand will come from. We simply stop driving in cities. We don't need to drive in cities when you've got a decent public transport system, unless you've got heavy loads, unless you're disabled, uh, unless you've got special circumstances of different kinds, and then you can have special circumstances or you can hire the cars or vans that you need for these exceptional occasions. And then we've got to make flying more expensive. It's no accident that that huge growth 
in flying that we saw earlier came about when um, the uh, low cost airlines uh, came on stream. So that's all government stuff, but individuals can do lots too. We can switch to companies like Juliet's that only provide renewable electricity. Be warned about that because there's all sorts of greenwashing going on and has been going on for many years uh, where, where companies that actually provide lots of um, uh, non-renewable electricity uh, pretend you can go on a green tariff uh, and that um, in, some, in some sense, you know, you're, you're, you're contributing to, um, uh, to, to more renewables. That's, that's, a, that's very dodgy. Uh, we can travel less, especially by car and aeroplane, and you'll have seen that the Climate Change Committee projected that we would. If in an urban area, get rid of your car. Um, and that has the benefit not only that you don't travel so much by car, but so you don't need a car. And of course, you're saving the carbon that goes into making the car. And that's, as we saw in the life cycle earlier, not insubstantial. Change your car for an electric vehicle. Um, when you can and if you can afford it. Increase your use of public transport wherever possible. Walk and cycle to destinations wherever possible. I've found that um, putting my bike on a train um, and then cycling to wherever I need to go. Uh, you know, I'm not a young man, as you can see, but I can do between five and 10 miles uh, roundabout stations uh, quite easily. And um, that's possible. And then uh, use high speed trains for European transport rather than flying. I mean, perhaps I would also to say in an urban area, get rid of your car. Um, obviously, government has a huge role in improving urban infrastructure so that cycling becomes less dangerous and safer. I've been cycling in London since the end of the 1960s, so I've seen a bit of a sea change in that um, over these decades. Um, and it's, it's great. There are far more cycle lanes than there used to be, um, but uh, nothing like enough. And, and that's uh, an ongoing work in progress. There are some difficult issues still ahead of us. Um, mineral extraction for renewable electricity and, ba and, and batteries is an important issue. And uh, I was reading today about plans to uh, exploit uh, deep sea mining, uh, which is likely to be very, very damaging to the oceans. And uh, very often the rationale for that is that we need the minerals from the bottom of the sea in order to make our batteries and our wind turbines. New high-speed rail, rail lines are environmentally damaging in themselves in the UK. We've had lots of demonstrations again, against HS2. I, I continue to think on balance, we need high-speed rail uh, to substitute for aircraft. But obviously, as an environmentalist, I don't like seeing these old growth forests being cut down to make way for them. And then we need to get Biofuels, but biofuels are problematic. Most biofuels at the moment for transport come from palm oil plantations, which have replaced tropical forests because we're not smart enough to have regulations to only permit certain sorts of biofuels that have been sustainably produced. And then I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk a little bit about offsets. I'm so nervous about this whole offsets business because uh, everyone is saying that they're going to offset their emissions. And that's uh, absolutely impossible. The whole idea of offsets was that they should be there just for the really difficult to abate emissions, that small residual quantity after we've done everything we can. And the issues are that if you offset by trying to grow trees, which is one of the main forms of offsets, well, firstly, um, in order really to be compensation for the carbon that you're emitting, they've got to last forever. And we've all seen wildfires that are taking trees, burning trees, putting that carbon back into the atmosphere. Many of those, uh, in California especially, many of those forests that you've seen go up in smoke um, will have been uh, the, result, you know, the result of offsetting, of people trying to offset their flights. Even if those trees do grow and last, well, they only absorb carbon when they're growing, and it takes them 30 years to absorb the kind of amount of carbon that you might be offsetting but when you, you burn that carbon, it goes into the atmosphere immediately and adds to global warming immediately. And it's only over the next 30 years that uh, you, you get a benefit. And then on additionality, uh, if, for example, instead of growing trees, you're building wind turbines, as people sometimes advocate, well, you've got to make sure that that does indeed substitute for fossil fuels 
rather than just adding to the overall energy supply. And very often that's not the case. So that's um, all I want to say. Looking forward to some questions, difficult questions, uh, I hope. And um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, one question I've got, I was, it, it may seem a little absurd, but uh, the whole concept of, at least in city areas, having electric bikes and trikes and scooters and things like that, I've always wondered that cars were just, they're just such heavy things that even use ele electricity to get around with them is a problem. And I've just, I could see a real potential growth for those sorts of devices, particularly for, I'm not suggesting you're old, sir, uh, but for, um, for other members of the community who, who might find cycling a bit difficult, for example. How do you see that, that evolving in the next five to 10 years? Um, I, I, think, I think regulation has, has a, an important role to play. Um, I mean, we're seeing a bit of a chaos in London streets from um, uh, some of these smaller electrically power, powered vehicles, if you like. I mean, there's even been a case of uh, kids being run over in parks and and uh, and quite seriously injured. Um, a couple of people have been killed um, on the roads in these things, uh, these scooters. Uh, potentially, I think they're a very good idea, but they're not always driven responsibly any more than cycles. Uh, bicycles are all, always driven responsibly. Um, and so uh, I, I, I think, yes, they could become an important uh, means of replacing cars, I hope replacing cars. I would just say that one of the great benefits of cycling is that they give you great health benefits, which scooters don't. And yeah. um, certainly I've very much appreciated in the cycling that I do, the fact that it keeps me active, keeps me reasonably fit, uh, otherwise in a, in a very urbanized life that I have sitting in front of a computer. Um, that is not something that I'd get from a scooter. Yeah, no, I, I realize that it's uh, just a thought. Um, I love cycling too, so yeah. Um, good, all right. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I think other questions will probably come with time as uh, has been said by Cass, who's the organizer. Uh, there are many people gonna listen as and, and look on as we go on. But thanks again for your erudite uh, uh, commentary. Okay, uh, that's good. Cheers. Bye. Um, thank you. So. Uh, we're now going to introduce Teresa Dominic, Associate Professor of Ecology in the Circular Economy, also at the University College London, Institute for Sustainable Resources, uh, Founding Director of the Circular Economy Lab and Plastic Innovation Hub. Uh, you're going to talk more about um, uh, the how we're going to reach net zero with the use of the circular economy. Thank you very much, Teresa. And you're on mute is the other little point. Oh, thank you, thank you so much for some, sorry, I was, I was <laughs> muted. Um, thanks for the introduction and, and thanks for inviting me to be here. And it's a pleasure to talk after uh, Professor Polikins and, and Juliet about how can we contribute to a transition to our circular economy and how this can help to achieve net zero. I think we have heard uh, from the previous presenters that this is not an easy pathway. I think we are saying it quite, uh, I mean, we are hearing everyone saying we are going to reach net zero by 2050, but it's still very unclear how we are actually going to do it. And I think most of the discussions have focused on the energy sector, which is truly one of the main um, contributors to, to climate change. But actually, as we will see in, in the presentation today, resource use is also at the core of um, the, uh, at the core of, of emissions and, and how much emissions, carbon emissions is in many occasions, not so much linked to the energy sector, well, indirectly linked to the energy sector, but more about the extraction and refining of raw materials that we will use in different activities in the industry, but also in, in our households. So in my talk, I'm going to, um, to discuss what is the role of resources and also what is the role of waste. And I'm going to bring uh, this framework of circular economy as a way to, to build a bridge between waste and resources and, and also try to see a new perspective where waste is no longer a waste and is actually a resource and is kept in the system. 
So we, we need resources. We use resources for our daily life. We need resources to maintain our levels of well-being and our standards of living. And we depend uh, for our living, for our survival entirely on natural resources. Um, humans, we cannot really produce anything. We can only transform things that have been produced by, by environmental systems food, furniture, housing, anything that we use on our daily lives, they all come from a combination of renewable resources, things that can be regenerated and non-renewable resources, things that cannot be regenerated in a human time scale. But we also use a lot of water, soil, air, um, biodiversity and land. And we require all these to, to, to maintain our, our lives, to survive. Um, the worrying trend is that actually what we have seen in the latest uh, years, in the latest decade, is that we consume more and more resources and the pace of consumption of those resources is increasing. So we are consuming resource, more resources and we are consuming them at a faster um, pace. So if we see here in this graph, uh, we are plotted uh, population, material footprint and GDP. And well, the colors are not very, very clear, but this line, the, um, the darker or orange line, that's material footprint. Material footprint is how much resources we need uh, to, to fulfill our domestic demand. So uh, the demand, uh, the final demand of um, a society. And what we have seen is that the uh, growth of material footprint has not all doubled since the 90s, but also has um, grown at a faster pace than both population and GDP. So we are consuming more resources, we are consuming at a uh, faster pace, even uh, if we take into account um, growth of, of population around the world. So this is uh, one thing. Then the other thing that we see when we analyze data about resources is inequality and this is very clear uh, high income countries they consume about 15 times more resources than for example low income countries um, we are consuming as much resources because actually we are importing resources extracted from other parts of the world so we are sustaining our current consumption of resources by extracting resources somewhere else in the world and consuming in uh, high um, income and developed countries. So that means that a lot of the impacts that we generate with our consumption, uh, we generate them somewhere else. And so we don't see them in a way. So this is, it creates a profound um, inequality, not only in the amount of resources we consume, but also who is bearing the cost and, and the burden of the environmental impacts. The other key dimension that is important to, to understand is resource productivity. And here, when we talk about resource productivity, we are uh, using a kind of different indicator. Before we, are, uh, we were looking at uh, um, volumes, we were looking at volumes of materials. Here, we are looking at an economic indicator, it means that is how much uh, of different types of resources we need to create one unit of output, in this case, one unit of GDP. Uh, one dollar. So we, what we see in this graph is that actually there has been a very slow uh, progress in resource productivity. Uh, globally, um, the, the rate of resource productivity has been stagnant um, over the years, over the last uh, almost 10 years at, at 1.6. So we need a 1. Uh, uh, 1.16 kilograms of material to produce uh, one dollar of, of value. And that has not really changed in the last 10 years. We see some areas in the some regions in the world where there's a slight uh, increases in resource productivity, but they are quite small. So they are not sufficient to make the transition that we need to make if we want to live um, in a net zero or in a sustainable world in the future. And also uh, part of these um, high uh, resource efficiency areas, like for example, Europe and North America, where we have a high level of resource productivity compared with other area, that has been partly uh, achieved through relocating less efficient activities, material and energy intensive activities in other areas of the world. 
So what happens in the UK? What is the picture? Are we better off? Are we uh, doing it better here or not? Um, what actually we here we use a slightly different indi indicator, and that's why you see that some of the uh, of the numbers they seem lower. But basically, what it says is that the UK, if we compare it with Europe, uh, we are using less resources per capita than uh, the average European. Um, uh volume of, of resources which is around 15 tons per capita 15 tons per capita if you don't i mean it's, it's really a huge amount of resources if you could try to picture as skips or or big construction skips uh it could actually um be quite impressive the amount of each of us uh is consuming a year so the fact that the uk has relatively smaller uh resource use per capita compared to other European countries. It's not so much because we are doing very well in the UK, but it's more a result of the industrial structure. We have less domestic extraction, and therefore, because of the way this indicator is built, uh, it shows that we are consuming, on average, less uh, resources per capita. So what are the implications of resource use? Why are we or should we be concerned with our resource use? Uh, well, first of all, because uh, we have seen that the level of extraction and the level of consumption is increasing more and more and it's increasing at a faster place and that's for sure not sustainable, but it's also the extraction and processing of those natural resources requires a lot of energy and requires a lot of auxiliary materials. And it has been calculated that around, I mean, there's different uh, figures here, but uh, between 50 to 70% of all carbon emissions are associated with the extraction and processing of natural resources. And if we look at other impacts, like for example, water, stress and biodiversity, 90% of those impacts are associated with the way we use resources and we extract resources. Um, Certainly, we also have to highlight that not all the resources have the same impact. And, and I think Paul has been mentioning some, some findings from LCA. I also will present some findings from LCA life cycle assessment studies. And you here have two examples, one on food and one on, on packaging materials. And we see um, it does matter what kind of food we consume. And not all food categories or all food types will have the same impact in terms of carbon emissions. We have here, for example, beef, which is a clear outliner compared to other different types of foods in terms of carbon emission is very, very high emitter of carbon or contributor to carbon emissions. And then on the other hand, we have plastic packaging and we compare plastic, conventional plastic uh, with other alternatives. And we also see that um, there's quite a lot of differences in terms of uh, the implications, the carbon implications of different types of materials. But also what we, what is imp also important uh, to understand from this uh, picture of resource use is not only that we consume a lot of resources, but it's also very worrying that a lot of these resources we consume, we extract from the earth and, and we consume, they are actually ending up as waste. About one third of everything we consume will be waste in the near future. So that means that we not only consume a large amount of resources, but we also have a system where that produces huge amounts of waste. And waste has a, um, a lot of different implications in terms of environmental impacts, but also in terms of carbon impacts. That means we are using uh, or we are emitting carbon by uh, extracting and refining a number of raw, uh, raw materials that then they are all going to end up in waste and we will have to emit even more carbon to actually try to get rid of that waste. Um, if we look here, we have um, uh, in, the, in one of the images, uh, we have a distribution of different types of waste uh, by economic activities and households for Europe. And this includes the, uh, the UK. And we see that normally one thing that we tend to pay a lot of attention or where a lot of money is being invested is in uh, municipal solid waste. Municipal solid waste is very, very small fraction of total waste. And it's also um, a very difficult type of, of waste because there's um, 
it's potentially quite cross-contaminated and there's um, very limited options into the kind of treatments or the kind of, of ways where you can recover that waste. We also see that um, a large fraction of the, of the waste, the uh, largest fraction of waste, around 60% of all waste comes from two main sectors, mining and construction. So if we want to tackle uh, resource use and we want to tackle waste, then we have to certainly be looking at those sectors. Um, also in the other image, I don't know if you can see very well, it's, it's quite small, but it gives you a breakdown of the different types of waste treatments, the different ways in which we treat our waste in, in Europe. And Europe is supposed to be the front runner in waste management. We, this is the best <laughs> we can get. And actually in this best uh, kind of best practice scenario, which is Europe compared to other countries, we are only uh, ready, uh, recycling less than 40% of all the waste we produce. So a large proportion of European waste still goes to landfill and it still goes to incineration. And if you see the breakdown by country, you will be surprised by some of the green countries producing not only huge amounts of waste, but also producing a huge amounts of waste that will end up in landfills. And of course, uh, we have a large number of Eastern European uh, countries that rely almost solely on, on landfilling waste. And landfilling waste matters, and it matters a lot in terms of carbon emissions. I think there's kind of an urban myth that it doesn't matter where you put your waste or it doesn't matter whether it's recycled or not. It actually does, and it has very different carbon implications. This is an example from a recent paper, well, it's not yet published, on food, and where we look at life cycle assessment uh, of different treatments for uh, food waste. And if we see here, if, uh, the way to interpret this data is that we, if we compare anaerobic digestion, which is a biological recycling of food waste, incineration with energy recovery, and so recovering the energy embedded in food waste, and landfill, we see that both anaerobic digestion and incineration are carbon positive um, activities. It will help to, to decrease overall carbon emissions because you are, uh, you are generating um, biomethane in case of the of, of, of anaerobic digestion and that's uh, that's a renewable type of energy that is substituting uh, carbon or fossil fuel based energy and in this case of incineration you are also replacing um, uh, electricity generated by fossil fuel and therefore they are carbon positive compared to landfilling which has huge implications in terms of climate change so that it does matter where we put our food waste and it does matter whether or not we segregate our food waste and where does it end up um, I'll give you another example, and, and I don't know if we, we have time, um, I'll try to be quick with that, but it's another example of why single um, small scale measures are not sufficient to tackle the size of the challenges that we had ahead of us. And I think Professor Ekins has been very clear about that in, in his last uh, part of the presentation. And I'll give you an example, a very clear example around waste, uh, which is plastic bags. Uh, plastic bags uh, charts were introduced by the government in 2015 in the UK as a way to, to reduce the use of single use plastic bags by super in supermarkets. Um, single use plastic bags were one of the most littered types of waste in, in UK and other parts of the world. And they were very difficult to recycle for a number of different reasons I won't go into detail now. Um, so they decided let's tackle this, let's reduce uh, single use plastic uh, bags. And uh, we do that through an economic instrument, which is putting a price of uh, single use plastic bags. And they, they were charged as five, uh, five and 10 P, uh, um, depending on, on the different types of, of options. And they were labeled, so they were supermarkets, basically what they do is substitute the single use plastic bags by bags that they call bags for life. And those bags for life, they were made of a thicker, thicker uh, plastic uh, material and um, they were um, costing 10 to 20p. 
And uh, according to the supermarkets and the government, this measure was a huge success. Uh, use of single-use plastic bags fall, uh, fell in that during that period by 95%. But they didn't tell the other part of the story that actually the production of plastic waste didn't reduce because one, people were still buying the bags for life. And there was a study, recent study of saying that on average people buy around 55, uh, 57 per, uh, plastic bags, these uh, bags for life in a year. So that means that you consume more, over uh, one plastic bag per week. And also uh, those were made of a thicker plastic material and overall the, the volume of waste didn't reduce. So this tell us one story. We need to look for different type of interventions, the interventions that look at um, different stakeholders, different parts of the supply chain, and they are more holistic in terms of what they want to achieve. And that's where it comes, uh, circular economy. And circular economy, I'm not sure if you are familiar with it, you might have heard about it, but it's a new perspective, a new perspective that breaks down the boundary between what is a resource and what is a waste. From the circular economy perspective, waste is a resource. It's a resource that has not been used in the right way or it has not been recovered in the right way to become a resource again. Um, so in this vision of circular economy, um, I think I'm, <laughs> I'm over time, but basically we have two cycles, technical cycle, biological cycle. And what we try to do is to keep materials, uh, to keep products, components and materials in the productive cycle for as long as possible. And when they reach the end of life, we have recovered different types of loops where we can recover back them into the system. And that can be through reuse networks, it can be through repair, maintaining, it can be through remanufacturing, or the last option, recycling. Uh, some people think that circular economy is about recycling, and actually recycling is the last or the least preferred option within the circular economy. Um, and this, uh, basically, if we want, I'll, I'll just go very quickly to that. So there's many things we can do. I don't think I have time to go through all the different options that I have here for government and citizens. But what I will do, um, I, th I think most of you joining today are joining from a citizen type of perspective. I think from the individuals I have um, also uh, a lot of power and a lot of um, opportunities to change and to shift uh, how things are, are being done. And for example, you can think about reducing consumption of single use items. You can think about extending the life of products and avoiding products that have very short uh, lives. Um, it's not only a material substitution exercise, I didn't explain it. Um, they have too much time to explain it, but it's not about uh, substituting fossil-based plastics by paper, because at the end of the day, that's not going to really make a big difference, but it's about trying to maybe encourage reuse or encourage uh, prevention of waste. Um, of for poor uh, resources such as car, books, we don't really need uh, to own a car. We can use a car when we need it, but for that, we have systems where we can share a car with other people. And we don't, um, there was studies saying that 90% of the time a car is just parked outside in the street. And it's not only using valuable public space, but it's also a waste of resources. Um, ensure pop, a proper segregation of waste streams because it does matter if, if you put your recycling within your recycling and the food waste separate, it does make a lot of difference. And it, actually this is the recovery of those um, materials and then opt for products with recycled content like packaging clothes even the mainstream uh, companies like H&M now they have uh, recycled fibers in many of their uh, textile lines and bio-based materials might be good uh, but it depends where the bio um, biomass comes from as Polly King was saying not all bio-based materials are always a good alternative we need to make sure that that biomass has been grown in a sustainable way or it comes from from waste so thank you so much sorry if i was a bit over time i'll try to <laughs> summarize as much as possible any questions they are very very welcome now mm. Okay, look, thanks, Teresa. That was really interesting. Um, I was thinking, and I'm going to ask uh, Juliet uh, uh, and Paul as well, uh, what one or two things are that the intensive care community could do 
at home rather than at work, because at work I know is another story that Eleanor and the rest of the team are going to talk about uh, already have. But what what of the list of items there would you uh, focus on uh, as being an absolute essential to reducing your carbon footprint? I mean, I personally could think meat would be one of the really big ones, but you might have other ideas there. Um, yeah, I can go. I can go first if you want. I think. Yeah, I think um, it has been proved that vegetarian diets have uh, lower carbon impact than other diets. But it's. it's not, I mean, there's, there's also possible if you want to eat meat, you can still eat meat, but you have to reduce the amount of some types of meat that have huge impact. So, seen beef have, like, having a huge impact, but things like chicken will have a quite similar impact. Like, for example, lentils. So it's, I mean, you could still enjoy your foods, but I think you have to be clear about those choices and about the implications of those choices. Mm. Thank but, you. And yeah, that's great. I'm just in the interest of time. Juliet, um, same sort of question. What one thing would you do? Uh, I can see you're still there uh, to, 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 uh, to focus on um, for the average doctor or in, uh, nurse in intensive care at home. Um, hi, folks. Uh, so uh, I agree on vegetarian, I think. Um, but if you look at heating, heating is our biggest challenge. So first thing you should do, check your form, get done with that. Make sure you're not overheating your house and wasting heat. Look at look at your insulation. Check the easiest things you could do on insulating is look at all the drafts and put a draft exclusion. Yeah, OK. Straightforward, simple, but useful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Paul, um, stop flying. Yes, I know that. Okay, what else? Yeah, I, I mean, I think for me, the first step has to be to measure your carbon footprint. There are lots of calculators online and you do that. Most people haven't a clue where their carbon emissions are coming from. The one I use is called Carbon Independent. And if you just Google that, it's there. It'll take you 10 or 15 minutes. You may have to go and get a little bit of data to find out from your energy bills, how much energy you use go and look at your motor car and see how many miles you're driving, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, uh, and, and human lives are so different that I know where my carbon emissions come from. Um, Pre-COVID, at least 25% of them came from, from business travel. Um, so I, 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 you know, flying around and stuff. So I know where my carbon emissions come from, but lives are very different and, and people have different sources of emissions and I'm amazed at how few people have ever done that. And it's, uh, you know, they say they're concerned about the climate, but they don't even bother to find out what contribution they're making. So that would be my number one. And then you'll see the hotspots. Then you'll see yeah. where yeah. it is that you could make the biggest difference. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, great. All right. Thanks, team. Uh, thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, and Juliet, I think, has just had to leave. Uh, thanks, Eleanor, and for Cass, who've organised the show, along with the other members of the Intensive Care Society. Uh, Eleanor, do you want to make a note about the next uh, talk, or uh, we're all going to gently make our way off into the limelight? Uh, Andrew Leach is just, thank you, very interesting. Thank you very much, Andrew, for making a comment. We might leave it there, unless uh, the Intensive Care Society wishes to speak further, but I'll, I'll leave that to him. Uh, cheerio from Australia. Uh, thank you very much for, for hosting. Uh, yes, we will continue our series next week, uh, focusing on money. And I believe Professor Eakins is going to come back to talk to us about investment and divestment. And uh, the tree and trees will talk to us about offsetting. So it should be a really interesting session because after all, money is power. Um, yeah. And then just the second point uh, as a call to the arms, really. Um, the Intensive Care Society is currently recruiting for their Environmental Sustainability Work Group. Um, so if you feel that you would like to get involved, please just have a look on the website and get in touch. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you all. I think it's quite suitable having Paul in his pinstripe suit talk about uh, money. I think that's really, that's, that's what we need. <laughs> Great. Thank yeah. you very much. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye.